kind of gender for you. Uh, hi everyone. Good afternoon uh, from Johannesburg, from Wits University. Um, my name is Imran Velodia. I'm going to chair the proceedings today. Um, I just wanted to say uh, kind of a few things about the, uh, the, the kind of event today and the program, and then I'm going to pass it on to our speakers. Um, so I think it would be fair to say that we live in a moment of quite, quite sort of deep despair, and that there's a, a, a kind of sense of the politics of the, of the country being uh, something that doesn't inspire us with much hope. I think it would be fair to say that there's a kind of global part to, 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 to that, so in some ways we part of that global process, but I think there's kind of also a set of local issues that kind of drive that. So it's kind of really a time perhaps for, uh, for, for us in South Africa and perhaps globally to be thinking a lot more imaginatively and to be thinking a lot more creatively about potential solutions to the problems that we have and for us to think a lot more bravely and a lot more th uh, th uh, th thoughtfully about the kind, kind of society that we, uh, that we would want to have. So a few of us were kind of having a conversation about this and we, we were struck by the fact that kind of Rick, uh, Turner's work really speaks in some ways to, to kind of a similar set of issues. And we were also struck by the fact that m mentioning the, the, the name Rick Turner might mean something for a lot of us who are kind of either as gray as I am or grayer, but that most of the kind of students at WITS and members of the younger generation really don't know much about kind of about Rick's work. So it was with that in mind that we, we partnered with the Daily Maverick to kind of host the, the, the kind of seminar today jointly with them. And it's kind of really a, a kind of opportunity for us to, to kind of reflect on a, 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 a past that also had some, some amount of, of kind of despair and some amount of a sense of hopelessness. But w w what the book that Rick wrote really kind of creatively d does is to see uh, a, a, a kind of new society and a pathway to a new society at a time when um, I would argue things were, were kind of probably more uh, 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 pessimistic than they are today. So it's really, we, we, we kind of thinking about the seminar as some kind of offering of hope for South Africa, some hope for, for uh, 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 the globe. We've designed a kind of pretty packed sort of program and we've got, we've got six colleagues who are going to speak, so we'll, we'll uh, kind of start with Jerry um, Mare, who is an um, 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 emeritus professor at UK's ZN. And kind of Jerry, I know, has been thinking about these ideas about utopian thinking for a long, long time. And this was a, a, a kind of great opportunity for us to uh, get him to think a lot more deeply about it and share his thoughts w with us. So we'll, we'll kind of start with Jerry. Uh, Fosia Turner uh, Stagliano was 
kind of really close close to Rick um, and 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 played quite a, a, a kind of important role in in both kind of shaping his his kind of ideas but also in sharing his kind of ideas at a time when Rick was not able to do it because he was banned. Um, and I'm really thrilled that we can have some reflections from her um, at the seminar today. So, so kind of she'll speak second. We then sort of really wanted to hear some voices of, of kind of younger uh, 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 people. And I'm thrilled that, that kind of Etumaleng Mohale, um, um, who's a, a, a kind of economics graduate of the university and an intern in SCIS, uh, kind of agreed to speak. We'll have some short reflections from him and then move on to Ruth uh, uh, Castel Branco, who leads our. Uh, Kind of future of work program in SCIS, um, and and I'm I'm kind of really looking forward to hearing Ruth Ruth's thoughts. We'll then have a short a short Q and A session, um, and we'd like to encourage everyone that's online to 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 kind of use the Zoom. For function to ask uh, some questions and and uh, to share some thoughts. We'll then close off with a few reflections from uh, kind of Eddie Webster, who shared lots of 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 time with Rick, and 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 uh, kind of has been uh, quite instrumental in both SCIS, uh, but, but also in kind of in us doing the seminar. And then a final word from um, Mark Hayward, who's a, kind of been a great partner to us in this initiative. So let me stop there and uh, pass the floor on to Jerry. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you very much, Imran. Fifty years ago, 1972, a very different South Africa. A South Africa that was in a number of fundamental ways changed in 1994. Rick Turner, political philosopher, publishes the book The Eye of the Needle, Essays on Participatory Democracy. He was a young author in the early 30s, recently arrived in Durban. The book was an engagement with the place and with the times in which he found himself. At the book's heart is a method for being an agent for change in society. I feel honored to participate in this event. And I'm very glad that Imran used two terms there. He spoke about he spoke about a conversation, and he spoke about it as a seminar. So this is not a lecture. These ideas that I'm putting out here, I myself battle and grapple with and revisit all the time. Um, and it's, it's taking place because of several of the people involved here were either in Durban at the particular time, people at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies were in Durban at the time, and experience that moment that has subsequently been called the Durban moment to capture some of the excitement and participation of many people in processes of change. And other people were there during the aftermath of that Durban moment. Turner, Rick Turner was a vital part of that moment. Within it, he called for the practice and the exercise to engage in what he called utopian thinking. 
Very glad that Fazia will be speaking later, as she can provide many, of the, many more of the personal details of that daily life. I'd, I can bring anecdotes, but they would, they would be um, only peripherally related to the topic that I'm talking about today. And, but it would include how I met her and Rick for the first time. I got to know Rick not as a teacher. He never lectured me. I'd completed my politics um, courses as a major with Michael Newpin. But I, as a friend and as a mentor, he participated, I participated in his life over the years. And I got to know him quite a bit better. Also, on the periphery, as a landlord. I lived in a backyard in a caravan in the place that, that Fazia and Rick occupied. So that personal is not directly part of what I'm talking about today. But one of Rick's students, Peter Sachs, he went to live in the USA, wrote a poem from there about him, about Rick, in 1978. And I want to read a few lines from this. Those of you who are familiar with the Raven edition of the book Eye of the Needle, or of the more recent one, the 2015 edition, will know that I'm quoting from the from the full poem that was initially used by Tony Morfitt in writing about Rick Turner. Sax's poem, Sax's poem captures Rick and his style of being in the world as I also remember him, the years that I spent in that backyard. The poem goes, you sat among us on the floor, translating Altissa, barefoot, jeans, a pale blue shirt, your black-rimmed lenses doubling the light, the red shock of your hair. At some slight turn of argument, your freckled hands followed the actual phrasing in the air. Quote, I know it's difficult in this country, but we've got to think more clearly than the state allows. And the title that I've given to what I'm saying today is from that. We've got to think more clearly than the state or the society as the present allows. Poem continues, three years later, you were banned, neither to be published nor quoted in any form, forbidden to teach. This event is referring to a period in 1970, this particular sketch that I'm quoting over here. But Eric was banned in 1973, three years later. I want to refer to one other person who was very close to Rick at that time as a student, Peter Hudson, valued lecturer at this university, the University of Witwatersrand, until his recent death. He was also a student of Rick's at the same time as Sachs. Hudson wrote an article in 27 called Let's Talk About Rick Turner. It begins like this. I lost my copy of Ma's Little Red Book on a very hot January afternoon in Durban in 1972. I am still He's writing in 2017. Not sure how it happened because it was always so I was always so careful with it. After all, it had been given to me by Rick Turner. People knew, know that he was a Sartrean through and through. But I suspect far fewer were aware of his deep interest in Mao and the Chinese Cultural Revolution. I remember that particular time and the books that Rick circulated on the Chinese Revolution. In my experience and discussion with Rick, if you offered up a thought or an observation, his question was frequently, why? It wasn't enough to sound clever or to say something that seemed true, as students uh, want to do. It, we were challenged with why, and then had to think things through towards their conclusion, to engage with ideas. And that was so much part of that period. And that's what he left with me. He never taught me, as I've said. But that having to grapple with ideas. There was a lot to know about Rick. He was this complex human being, but there was a, but there was a state run by vicious and ideologically crude people determined to understand him in a crude, unidimensional way. 
Such was required in their commitment to safeguarding race apartheid and capitalism as pillars of everyday society in the early 1970s in Durban and in South Africa. From that perspective, Rick's assertion to anyone who would, who would listen was so important and so central. We've got to think more clearly than the state allows. The terms in which we think must be our own. Just before he was forbidden to publish and it was illegal to quote him, Rick Turner wrote The Eye of the Needle, first published by Sprocas, the special program for Christian social action, which was an anti-apartheid Christian activist organization which had approached him to confront their audience with this book and the ideas it contains. There are several ways we can measure the book's impact and, the import and, and its importance. The easiest would be largely an academic exercise, which we're all in this age of electronic studying and searching, ex an academic exercise, identifying authors and works that cite him and I have the needle itself over 50 years. But there's another legacy, less easy to measure, but much, much more important. This lies in the immediate context and community in which Rick's, Rick Turner's ideas were formulated and received in the decades of his active life. The people he influenced to take action in the world of South Africa during the 1970s. Let me suggest a few avenues of that influence. Although not religious himself, Rick networked with religious organizations because there is a represented, hopefully, a thinking, moral community, and he could speak to them. He spoke to religion in general as well. He taught then at the University of Natal, UN Durban, UND as it was known, which had him interfacing with a very wide range of colleagues and students. Thirdly, he had friends across apartheid's racialized spectrum in that city with whom he entered into intense discussions, listened to many of those in the house, as was his wont. His ideas were conveyed to the readers of the first and then later editions of The Eye of the Needle and through a range of other writings, some of it that had to appear in other people's names as he was banned and he couldn't be quoted. And many here now in the hybrid presence of this event, will count themselves in the number of activists, teachers, lecturers, researchers, lawyers, trade unionists, politicians, artists, and others who were influenced by Rick. And no doubt they in turn could also name a very long list of other names not present today. It was an oppressive time, but also an exciting and challenging time to be young, the late 1960s and early 1970s. From 1970, Rick Turner was employed as politics lecturer. 1973, he was banned. In January 1978, he was shot dead. In his home, having lived a life that threatened apartheid power, from his chosen indirect battlefield against that system. His assassination came a few months after the similarly gruesome killing of Steve Biko in September 1977. Rick and Steve had known each other in Durban and interact, interacted on various levels in the city. Steve then at the medical school at the same but racially segregated university. Both had been banned by the state when they were killed. What strikes me with so much force as I speak here today is that these were both young people. <laughs> I mean, it might sound a bizarre, banal kind of statement to make, but I'm speaking now from 2022. And they were so young. Their lives were short. Turner was born in 1941, Biko in 1946. Turner was 37, and Biko was 31 when they died. It, it, it never struck until I wrote it down a few weeks ago. These young people proposed a radical alternative to what existed and an alternative way to make sense of life in the present in order to think about what might be. 
Their deaths spoke in some measure also to how precarious the system was, except, that is, for its fearsome ability to apply violence and in the large and petty ways it managed to fix ideas about hierarchical and horizontal difference as a basic structure of life in South Africa. I want to raise the challenge for our world today of Rick's method and its goals, found here in Eye of the Needle, even as we face different circumstances half a century later. Let us see how we may apply Turner's method for some clear thinking of our own. What I will do is first briefly in broadest terms sketch aspects of the context in which the book appeared and why Rick was asked to write it. The context has to be factored into understanding the first presentation of utopian thinking and into any subsequent attempt to employ it. Utopian thinking occurs from a context. Second, I note that the Sprocas Commission shaped how Rick approached the task. The content is, if you read it, you'll see he writes it from a particular aspect perspective with a particular audience readership in mind. But the presentation places its response within a wider approach to the social world and as method and attitude to understanding and changing it. It is certainly not confined to the religious field from which he draws to indicate a different way of being human. Finally, I will outline, and this is where I really struggle, I will outline how this approach speaks for me to the present in a new context of challenges. Specifically, as the, as been called and I'll refer to again, the tyranny of the now, in multiple ways militates against long-term thinking, because that's really what utopian thinking is. Thinking beyond the present, thinking into the future. Can we apply Turner's method of utopian thinking? I know it's difficult in this country, he said, but we've got to think more clearly than allowed. It is here where I have to do most rethinking, once asked to participate and where I'm least at ease. Okay, that first thing. Rick's friend Tony Morfitt, Tony also died recently, called that notable buzz and blend of imagination, creativity and activism in Durban and the period of the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the Durban moment. It was a period of ferment that left Marx into the future nationally. Both Rick and Steve Biko were central to that moment and to a range of involvements. Banning, Rick in 1973, cons cons consigned them to prescribed spaces, far apart, restricted to lives that were intended to isolate them, and prevent them from disseminating their ideas. Their very being was affected, whether through the spoken or the written word. Books at the time appeared with blacked out sec sections. I think the word now is frequently is redacted. It, you can look at old copies of surveys of race relations or of the Black Review, and you'll find blacked out sections. People printed books and then the person was, somebody was banned and you had to black out that section in the book to be able to carry on distributing it. There was, of course, no social media. Effectively, no World Wide Web yet, no cell phones. And looking back, it may be because of the absence of distracting social media platforms with the enticing, distracting and provocative fragments that we need to make sense of the importance of books, of face-to-face -face gatherings, of the personal relations and activist networks for disseminating ideas, to appreciate the effective opportunities that yet existed for the robust exchange of ideas among people who were keen and passionate to participate in pursuing change then. That absence of social media, of cell phones, etc., points to why the state tried to deal in silencing. But the silencing took a different form. Banning, jailing, and killing people. Censoring certain texts and whole books as it attempted to create and maintain a society of inequality and difference. 
This context also shaped how the secret police, the security police, the SB, special branch, intimately operated, intimately following, in person, infiltrating, recruiting people, sending in spies, with intelligence and paper reports and photo albums, and filed on shelves, intercepting and confiscating letters and publications, listening in on the telephone. You could hear, when the thing was happening, you could hear, click, <laughs> that something was happening. It was a different way of being aware of being listened to. Rick was banned in the year after I appeared, Eye of the Needle. So, an absence of social media has to be taken into account and understanding. But the big and overwhelming presence which summed up most of social and political and personal life was apartheid, that word. Spatial, political, social, economic separation. But also integration in a capitalist system of ownership and labor, and all occurring in a single state. Powers wielded in changing forms through physical and social exclusions, rooted in an all-encompassing notion of race, deeply tied up to class and gender. But during the 1960s, and this has to be noted as well, apartheid added something new, with implications for the post-1994 period society and for the future from here on. No longer informed just by race, but now ideas about ethnic nations, fragments to be decolonized and separately developed, spatially separated in the form of the so-called homelands or Bantistans, or self-governing states, as even later. The viciousness of forced removals to create these states became daily practice. The very, the, this little snippet, the very first book that I ever published under my own name was thanks to Eddie, who was then um, linked to race relations, and I wanted, I approached them to write a book on forced removals. African population relocation in South Africa came out of that tiny little book, trying to make sense of exactly that separation process that was taking place viciously at that stage. Policy and language of ethnic traditional subjects were to serve politically as well to fragment ideas about historically shared blackness and the inclusive black consciousness promoted by Biko and his comrades. Furthermore, it worked to devolve some of the rewards of employment in governance and control and of capitalism itself to subjects in the homeland territories. So it offered the opportunity to participate in government, in democracy and in capitalism, but in these structures created by apartheid. So it wasn't, simply, it wasn't simply manipulation and domination. And without that, one cannot understand why those ideas have continued to this very day. Capitalism was a given for apartheid state strategists. And to be a worker for many black Africans meant migration and confinement in labor barracks, far from families in the homelands. By the late 1960s, the trade union movement for black people had been decimated. Political resistance at political and national level had been attacked through the banning of organizations and through the incarceration and banning of leaders and organizers. The state in the late 1960s was relatively confident about its grip on, it, on power. That's all I'm going to say about, uh, about the context, but it's, it has to be taken into account. We have to understand when the book was written to be able to understand how we can take it further if it's possible. Secondly then, Rick approached this, the apartheid state as both racist and capitalist, and that's what the eye of the needle is about. He saw it as having not only material and a socio-political effects, but also psychological or existential consequences. Yes, apartheid maintained itself through a powerful and viciously militarized security system, but at the same time, as with any system of rule, it dominated, albeit unevenly, through ideology as well, the way in which we think. 
shaping everyday sense-making, employing material historically given to its own ends. Enter the eye of the needle. And that's, this is my opportunity to show you the little book, the first edition. This is what it looked like. It was cheaply produced. Cost was a necessary consideration of all opposition organizations and individuals at that time. The copy I hold here shows this. It's not cut square. If you put it on a table, you'll see it leans across like that. The, the layout on each page was not the same on every single page. There's no title on the spine. So you had, at that time you had, I still have racks, whole sections of my book, book collection has no spine and they all put together because you'd have to pull them out to see what they were. So at least they're all in the same space. Compare this to later editions, such as the one produced by Raven, which I, my copy has disappeared, and the most recent, the 2015 edition, even with the reproduction of a Kentridge uh, painting on the cover. The first edition carried a short foreword dated April 1972 by Peter Randall, who would launch the publishing firm Raven Press soon after that. He was then in Sprokaz. Randall writes that this short book, 90 pages only, and I quote, is the first publication in a new series by Sprokaz 2, that being a Sprokaz 1, in which the intention is to contribute to thinking about long-term alternatives to the present social order in South Africa captures that idea. We have to think into the future. We can't simply live in that, the moment of the oppression of apartheid. One important task of Sprokas too should be to encourage thinking and discussion about radical alternative models of society, which analysis of our own situation suggests are needed in the ongoing debate about the future of this country. Captures well what then happens. And this is what I have the needle work to tackle, exploring long-term alternatives, citizens no longer to be subjected to the existing ruling ideas, but to realize that they could and should be creators of alternatives. But how to convince of such reconstruction? That was Rick's task in life, convince people of alternatives. This is how he went about it. On the first page, Turner wrote that there are certain things that may be absolutely impossible, such as to teach a lion to become a vegetarian. But then there were other things that were impossible, not because of nature, but because of social realities. For example, under apartheid, it was impossible for a black person quote, to become Prime Minister of South Africa. So that's the example that he gave to get people thinking. How then to open possibilities with what seems impossible through utopian thinking? The first chapter, hardly four pages, called, was called The Necessity of Utopian Thinking. Turner says there are two reasons for engaging in utopian thinking. The first is that we need to explore and, if necessary, attack all the implicit assumptions about how to behave towards other people that underlie our daily actions in all spheres. Okay, so it has, it's we. We have to change. These assumptions, sense-making, undergird the structures that maintain such an order as existed under apartheid. In other words, an attack on our personal behavior towards others, whether groups or individuals, will be in effect challenging, challenging the order of society itself. Start off with the individual, start off with the consciousness, start off with the beliefs that people hold about what's possible and impossible. Change that and you can get people to change the, the world in which they find themselves. The second reason for utopian thinking was this. 
Unless we can see our society in the light of other possible societies, we cannot even understand how and why it works as it does, let alone judge it. We need some kind of comparison. Find it in other societies, find it in a society that you feel is utopian, is the ideal, is different, fundamentally, essentially different from where you find yourself. For Turner, as Tony Morford observed, utopian thinking constitutes a theoretical attitude. It's an ability to realize that what things in one's experience cannot be taken for granted. So the utopian question is not idealistic, not pie in the sky, not avoidance, not unrealizable. It's a, it's a thinking mechanism. It is a method located in radical, radically imaginative thinking to shake common sense, to remain open to and act towards other possibilities. In this case, beyond race, beyond capitalism, as it existed in apartheid South Africa in 1972. From there, the reader is challenged to step back and to return to what is being presented as the common sense of the everyday world. If it is impossible to have a black prime minister under existing conditions, what are the obstacles to the apparently impossible? because he's already challenged that notion of impossible as it applies to what we create ourselves. Utopian thinking recognizes that the way things are is itself a contingent status quo that requires active participation by people to maintain practices, ways of thinking and behaving for its maintenance. Finally, if humans built this history humans can change it. Motivated by that understanding and with a utopian conception of a goal, methods are formulated, obstacles are identified, primary agents are noted to reconstruct socially constructed society, to make the supposedly impossible become possible. Activism, research, organization, mobilization, agency, and aid agents. And the very next year was 1973, the strikes in Durban. Agents acting to create a society that was felt to be impossible at that stage, imagining it and st taking steps toward. Okay, so in summary, utopian thinking at its heart reveals the contingent and historically constructed nature of reality and promotes a method for imagining the possible, and thus for realizing it. The eye of the needle addressed the apartheid context employing this approach, a context in which structurally and ideologically race and capital were en enmeshed and together shaped exploitation and domination. Turner presented how these aspects were experienced by people belonging to class and racial groupings. He noted that for people immersed and invested in the system, it defined daily existence, and thus the direction for and perceived limits to what is possible. I quote Tony Morford again. Tony Morford wrote two very important essays. The one in 1990 when he gave the Turner Memorial Lecture, and the second one for this particular copy of, of Eye of the Needle that's over here now a subsequent essay on Rick and on Eye of the Needle. And he makes important, an important additional point on this method, or the, rather the way in which Turner presented it to, the readership, to a readership. And I found this fascinating. I'd missed it in the past. Namely, how it captured the imagination of a generation of intellectuals and activists coming from diverse backgrounds and commitments. Morford wrote, all utopias are fictions, and it may well be as well to consider Turner's claim for the necessity of utopian thinking as the necessity of fictional or imaginative thought. The book itself is a fiction in the sense that it makes dialectical connection between a deep and obscured past and a distant future. 
and so doing, it opens the present to a fresh inquiry and the potential to recast the conditions of the moment within a new social narrative. And one of the footnotes that I've got to what I've started writing over here, I had to draw attention to several books, fictional books, that deal with climate change. And they speak to, a, to an audience what Rick tried to do with Eye of the Needle in a similar way. In summary then, rather than start with short-termism and common sense with the everyday, with the tyranny of the now, Turner asked, asks us, the readers, to imagine what an alternative and better society would and should look like and how to get there. He had asked this of his chosen readers in 1972, in the first instance, white Christians. But it speaks more broadly if one starts looking at how he was doing it and what he was proposing. Then it speaks to a general audience. And he wrote, there's a, there's a subsequent piece to that book that was published in the Raven edition, uh, the, the present as history. Can't remember. In any case, that was added. And over there you see that he starts taking that wider perspective than from the particular audience that he had in mind that he was commissioned to do for the Sprocas edition, the first one. Okay, now the most difficult part. What challenges, what challenge does Rick Turner's approach offer for understanding and acting in post-1994 South Africa? Even more important, how does it speak to a South Africa in 2022 in a context that cannot but be global? Imran has already referred to both those points. It is 1990 brushing history talk. Um, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave that. It takes me off the argument. I think that, I think that what one needs to take into account as well is that Rick's approach, his particular focus on the individual and the individual consciousness, both him and Steve Beaker, they were calling to people to become a new person. I think that, I think that ideally that book should have carried some very practical responses of the agency that is called for by changing the way in which you think. And I think that there lies, lies if I have to find a problem in the, in the original book, it might lie there. But that's, I still have to think through myself. I do not take issue with Rick's approach and his method in the various ways that has been interpreted and affected activists and activism. Those remained stimulating, provocative, and not to be discarded, and most certainly did shape the way in which I selected topics in my own research over many years and published. That approach remained, that but the form it takes and where the results approximate what Turner had in mind is not always clear. What can the many people affected and influenced by him and by this book suggest? It would be fascinating to ask each one to write five pages on their life post reading Eye of the Needle or post knowing and attending his lectures in the 1970s. Okay, I'm going to be brief here because this is where I, this is where I'm going. Utopian thinking as a required step in unsettling the apparently fixed everyday is essential, remains essential. Those exercises of imaginatively presenting long-term alternatives to what exists apparently so firmly is certainly, as if you apply that, the looking back, it's easier to detect the obstacles that stand in the way and also to identify agents that are essential for that change. Agents in today's world, I hazard to say, are not singular. It's not the working class or not the single body of people. For the enemy is much more complex. In distinction to the way mobilization against apartheid was and could be thought of. 
A UDF, a United Democratic Front against climate change, is very, very difficult to imagine. I'll come back to that point. The singular enemy that apartheid was, therefore people were called to be united against apartheid, created a sufficiently shared goal, a world without apartheid, in a way a utopia, among a very wide range of interests. People came from all walks of life to join the UDF. It was an astonishing period of time in South Africa. There lay both the advantage and the danger. Once apartheid was dismantled, coalitions and solidarities dissolved, and structural and ideological differences surfaced with ever-increasing insistence, including even arguments on what apartheid actually was. A crucial thing to return to. What was this thing that we fought against? We still have race. We still have capitalism. What else was it? We still have Bantustans. Not called that anymore, but tradition. We still have tradition, we still have kings, we still have etc. So, what do I do with trying to think in a utopian fashion 50 years later? The world is ex extensively more fragmented and extended. We're no longer talking about the local. The nation state is absolutely part of something bigger. What happens here affects what happens elsewhere. A couple of days ago, I see that Ethiopia is on the point of generating its first electricity from the dam that was built in the blue, White Nile, that one of the biggest projects ever in Africa to generate electricity. That's without a contract with Sudan and with Egypt, downriver. That contract has not been signed. Where did it get bogged down? It got bogged down in an assurance that a certain amount, volume of water, will be released every year at certain times. That contract has not been signed. And I find it, Ethiopia would find it just about impossible to do that because of what weather is these days. You can't predict the rainfall. Droughts occur in various places. So how can you tell two other countries that rely essentially on the water coming down that river that we will release this much water at those particular times? So I think that, I think that the, the utopian thinking has to, has to find what I would suggest as an organizing principle, for the lack of a better word, that organizing principle is something that will affect, that is affecting the globe. And so much, I see that the, the, the inter, um, inter, inter IPCC is releasing into their next report within the next few days, and we've got people at this university who participate in that as well. That, the, the, the fact of global, the global climate catastrophe is there. And I think that that should be the overarch, the organizing principle to smaller versions of Frick's utopian thinking. They should inform how we decide on the scale of de democratic participation, population growth, food production. All of those things need to have a goal in mind, but that, those goals have to be shaped, not determined, shaped in some way by the knowledge of climate change. What that also, and that will be my last point that I make here, what I would also suggest, and that is, that is crucial to what I'm talking about, every single aspect of it, and that's the time frame in our own thinking. And when I say our own thinking, I'm talking about politicians, I'm talking about policymakers, I'm talking about researchers, I'm talking about teachers, and that is, do we think short term? Can we, are we able to think long term? Brought home, brought home with the recent um, local government elections, where I could not find a single, a single politician that was reported on or that listened on the radio or wherever that spoke about climate change, that spoke about anything beyond the short term. And you can see why. 
our lives depend on short-term thinking because that's where the rewards, that's where the problems lie. That's how they experienced Rick's existing society. Rick's what we need to think beyond. Makes sense, makes sense. It's not a case of not understanding it. It's a case of rejecting it because it stands in the way of dealing with the future. And it stands in the way of making decisions about how we create human solidarity. Human solidarity can still have difference and diversity, can still have all the, the issues, the smaller issues, the smaller group issues that we live with. They are important, they are essential to the people who belong to particular groups. But they, they do not solve the long-term problem. That long-term problem has got to take those into account, but in terms of a longer-term uh, way of thinking about what to be and what to plan and what to do. Without that, I think that we are in very deep trouble. Um, we're hoping, we're hoping, we're hoping in, a, in the next while to make available some initial where we put out these ideas about time thinking to a range of people, from lawyers through geologists through physicists, etc., and to get open a debate on exactly what long term thinking means. And keep your eyes open about that. I think that Rick would have said, maybe not why. He might have said, why not? So that's the challenge that I stay with and hopefully you take away. Thank you very much, Imran. Great. Uh, th thank you so much for that, Jerry. Uh, lots, lots to think about and, 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 and lots to to, um, to, to, to kind of shape our future there. Um, just two announcements before we move on to our next speaker. If you would like to buy the book, I'm extremely pleased that we've mem um, managed to arrange with uh, Love Books in Melville to get copies of the US edition of, of the book. So if you would, would like to get the book, please get in touch with L L Love Books or feel free to, to kind of drop us an email at SCIS and we can, we can put you in touch with, uh, with L Love Books. The kind of second announcement for those who are online, we're going to use the Q&A section in Zoom to, to, uh, to, to to take feedback and questions from you when we, we get to, to that point. We're now going to move on to, uh, 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 to our second speaker, Fozia uh, 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 Taliano. Uh, uh, Fozia uh, uh, studied in the early uh, 1970s at what was then called Salisbury Island, which then became the University of uh, uh, Durban Westville, um, and at UND, both institutions which then merged to, to then become UKZN. For um, a long time in the early 70s, uh, she coordinated the uh, kind of education programs in the Institute for Industrial Education, which was a kind of really key institution uh, kind of supporting the, the, the then emerging trade unions in Durban. In 1976, uh, uh, worked as an assistant to the uh, kind of legal team uh, uh, that, that, uh, that worked on the SASO uh, 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 BPC trial. Uh, she had to leave South Africa in 1981 and she's been based in the UK since then. She's worked there in um, a wide range of areas including uh, 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 kind of run, uh, run, uh, 
r r running a centre for 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 uh, uh, kind of gender. She worked she worked as a social worker, and she now r r runs a private practice um, as a trans personal th 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 therapist. So it's my great pleasure to shift us over to London and to ask uh, uh, for Fosia to speak. Over to you, Fosia. Thanks, Imran. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. So what I'm going to talk about first is to situate the eye of the needle in the current world context and then to talk about how the themes were interwoven in the way we lived our lives. So, since writing The Eye of the Needle, the societies we live in are more contracted and more self-focused. The language we use to describe problems and opportunities for change have become. But the basic issues, they remain the same. We are more connected technically and electronically than ever before in recorded human history, more wealthy in terms of availability of resources to meet human needs and the caretaking requirements of the planet, and yet we are more disconnected, more impoverished, more displaced, and more neglectful, if not disdainful, of our natural environment. The end of history and the promotion of the selfish gene offer no meaningful contribution or consolation to our global dilemma. And we are more compelled than ever to think beyond the given to question what is deemed inevitable about social development and fixed in human nature. Like the rest of the world, South Africa is at a crossroads. The democratic realm country that was triumphantly birthed with the transfer of power from the Nationalist Party has failed to deliver its promise. The promise of its commendable constitution, the undertaking of the trade unions to be the champion and bastion of participatory rights in the creation, management, and distribution of resources has collapsed into power grabs and the further entrenching of the rural-urban divide. Big issues for South Africa to deal with. We got to where we are both globally and specifically in South Africa because of the value choices we make collectively as a society and as, a, and as individuals in our personal lives. And these choices are based on our conscious or unconscious beliefs. The values that are laid bare by the choices that we have made prioritize profit over people exploitation over sustainability, greed over redistribution. The eye of the needle and the life of the man who wrote it continues to shine a torch to a sustainable future and the possibility of its creation. The only escape from cynicism and belief in one's own powerlessness, Rick wrote, is in articulating and defending a vision of an ideally possible society. Beliefs create reality. Who knew? I certainly didn't. But after encountering Sartre in the library at Salisbury Island and then Rick, the illusion that human beings have fixed natures determined by their genes and expressed as personality types was swiftly dispelled. That we can choose, to res that we can choose how we respond to rather than the act against situations was a powerful, liberating realization. We are not trapped in the sufficient task of unmaking or unmasking the global capitalist monstrosity that Western civilization has become in order to choose different values by which to live our lives. And acting on this belief, Rick and I chose to live our lives as freely as we could in an authoritarian, oppressive and racially divisive society. The statement repeated a number of times takes on the form and weight of fact. It becomes perceived as fact. There are facts that exist independently of human opinion, the stars in the sky, night following day, etc. 
We can apply different names to stars, we can call them, but the fact of their existence is incontrovertible. But then again, there are facts that bounce against the reality of beliefs. And no matter how much supporting evidence is presented, no matter how many surveys are conducted, those beliefs exist, persist in holding that version of reality as true, as self-evident. There are still people who continue to believe that the earth is flat, that the creation myth is a historical fact. There are people who continue to believe that Donald Trump is the rightful president of the United States of America. Arguing people into change without meeting them at their belief systems results mostly in further entrenchment of their beliefs. And over time, it generates conflict and sparks wars. And you may well be on the brink of yet another one, thanks to Putin. And also to authoritarian, oppressive, racially divided state uses fear and shame to keep the different groups in their designated places. It was self-evident to the state and the vast majority of whites that those who were not blessed by color and class were inferior species of beings whose only source of value was the provision of cheap and expendable labor. Rick and I chose to shrug off the coats of shame and fear and live openly as a couple, willing to take on the ubiquitous surveillance of the state, poised at any time to push us back into conformity and or prison. At the personal level, we chose to work through the concerns and anxieties of family and friends who feared for our safety and to be patient with those who, who thought us reckless and compromising both our academic and political futures. In February 20 2010, introducing Rick's work to the, to the online platform DISA, I wrote, at the tail end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, two men stood out above all their peers, two men who between them transformed predominantly the consciousness of black and white students in South Africa. One was Steve Biko and the other Richard Turner. Both men were unique outpourings of the vibrant richness of the South African soil, and this we must never forget. In them, we see blazing exemplars of human ability to harness their formidable energies to transform not only their own lives, but those of their compatriots as well. I was fortunate to befriend both on the same evening and a year later to be married to one. Growing up in Durban, living in the city center within a few minutes walk of the Indian markets, where in 1949, the month and year of my birth, the race riots had begun. The life I led prior to meeting Rick was manifestly different from what he had grown up in. He was raised in the English speaking world of white South Africa, where his identity and value were assured and reinforced by the laws, the media and the schools he attended. I had grown up in a society divided by race, culture and religion and fueled by uncertainty, suspicion and hostility. As a child of mixed parentage, according to South Africa's race categorization, I had to struggle to piece together an identity that kept me whole and around which I could build self-esteem and self-confidence. When we met, he was a lecturer at the predominantly white UND and I a third year English and philosophy student at the Bush University in Salisbury Island. He was seven years and three months older. He had lived in Paris and studied at the Sorbonne. The furthest I had traveled from Durban was to Cape Town and Johannesburg. We were both unknowns to each other. Neither had dated across the, the racial divide. We had no idea how it would work, whether we had the stamina, courage, and mutual trust to face the pushback we would get from the state, our families, friends and colleagues. By all that was self-evident in South Africa, our relationship had been a short-lived, partly courageous, partly foolish stab at facing off the legal and political constraints and prohibitions. That we found a home in each other and carved out a life rich in meaning and purpose was a fact 
that brushed strongly against expectation and reserved wisdom. But we knew that we had to make it up as we went along and to take it one step at a time. There were no roadmaps. There can never be no roadmaps. When you're working out what utopia could possibly mean for you, for the people you love, for the society in which you want to live. What made it possible for us, what gave us the legs to take the steps we did, was our willingness to think and live beyond the expectations placed on us separately by state, culture, and custom. We had to face daily the insidious remnants of our upbringing, pausing when stereotypical phrasing kept back into our thinking and words, when we stopped to ask each other, what did that mean for you? When X or Y said or did such a thing, how did it affect you? We had to learn to listen, to be respectful, that our expectations may not be the same, our responses may not be the same. The thinking that went into the writing of the Eye of the Needle was what created the bricks with which we built our life together. The Eye of the Needle was not only a radical critique of the exploitative and repressive underpinnings of the South African state and a blueprint of hope for a free and equal South Africa, it was also a reflection on a personal journey. A journey from separatist, disjointed, dualistic, oppositional thinking to holistic, interconnected, receptive thinking and living. The Eye of the Needle was more than a non-academically presented treatise on, on utopian thinking by a brilliant academic. It was a testament of hope. Richard Turner understood the power of words to make and unmake reality, to forge connection across opposing differences. He was, as you've all heard, and I'm sure you will hear repeated again and again, an excellent teacher and an inspiring speaker, capable of rousing his audience into strategic action and certainly to thinking differently. I once asked him what made him different. How did he manage to slough off 29 years of inculturation and centuries of internalized dogma about class and race? He laughed and counted the question. Neither of us could give a pithy answer. Despite all the received wisdoms on both sides of the divide about the unsustainability of interracial relationships, ours worked. It just seemed effortless because of the effort we put into it. Maybe it was because we were outsiders and at ease in our own company. Maybe it was because we found a spiritual home in philosophy and were both drawn and transformed by the writings of Jean-Paul Sartre. We met one evening in February 1970 he had been invited by the student committee of the Italian University's medical student, medical school to give a talk on black power. Despite the enthusiastic response of the audience, there was one who challenged the right of a white man to talk to black people about black power. The man who stood up after me to defend both the invitation and the speaker was Biko. A fortnight later, Rick was back at UNB to take part in a panel discussion on race. And it was at the impromptu party that followed afterwards that our friendship hedged towards a relationship. Driving us back into town afterwards, Steve joked that were we to be stopped by the police, he would deny any knowledge of the two people canoodling in the back seat. They had an easy friendship, Rick and Steve, one that would have deepened over time had Steve remained in Durban. He would visit us at home in Bel Air and on occasion spend the night. Discussion between the two of them was a feast for the mind. The security police were a constant presence, as was the threat of arrest and imprisonment. Every day, we breached the Immorality Act, the Group Areas Act, the Mixed Marriages Act. And after his banning, the terms of the banning order. Wherever we went, we were trailed by a number of the security police. We had to contend with daily acts of harassment. The house was firebombed, a truckload of bricks narrowly, narrowly prevented from being dumped in front of the house. 
to do with the cutting down of the bougainvillea hedge surrounding the property. One of our housemates arrived to find fires under the petrol tanks of the cars parked out in front. Our sleep would be interrupted by random police searches or army flares thrown at the side of the house. And yet, lectures were prepared, papers marked, talks given, meetings attended, meals cooked, friends visited, and children parented. In the midst of all that he did, he took the time to remain present to his two daughters. So he would call or write book letters so that they would, could have a tangible sense of who their father was and how he spent his time away from them. He loved reading to them. And when they were back in Cape Town, he would send them carefully chosen monthly books so that they could continue to enjoy the delights of the written word. Excuse me. The eye of the needle is important for many reasons. Chief among them is collapsing of the thought box upheld as reality. Rick urges urgently and cogently for the necessity of utopian thinking, thinking outside the box making ethical choices on the grand swell of our actions, using the power of our mind to imagine a reality that is better able to meet our needs than what we had been brought up to believe was possible. He understood more than his contemporaries that it is the power of the imagination that led Einstein to grasp E equals MC squared and in one equation to revolutionize physics and Schrodinger to find the cat that opened the box to quantum physics. And he would spend time talking physics to Derek Wang, who lived in the back of the house. He also instigated many cross uh, seminars, bringing all the different departments together so that there could be a sharing and an enriching of the information and a widening of understanding What Rick understood clearly was that apartheid was not an anomaly of the economic system, no more than the slave system had been an aberration of the feudal system. Just as the repeal of slavery brought relief to a specific set of hardships and ignominy, ignominy so too with the repeal of the apartheid laws. If the basic structure that permitted and enabled the system of injustices to prosper remained in place, Indeed, a system that was dependent on injustice and equality for its very survival, nothing except the superficial expression of its needs would change. And this is clearly, clearly seen, clearly experienced in South Africa. When you have the clarity and vision that Rick forged for himself, no obstacle was bigger than his ability to find a solution. And for the state, its final acknowledgement of defeat was to stop him with the bullet. He did, he did not believe that freedom could be granted or taken for granted. He took freedom as a right. That can only be grasped by an awakened mind, a mind open to thinking beyond the box and willing to face the uncertainties of the not yet known, as did Gandhi, as did Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Steve Biko, and so many more. And here we are now in post-apartheid South Africa, and the question is, how far have we moved outside the box? If Rick and Steve and the many other courageous visionaries were here today, would we still be willing to go further than the state allows? And would we have been willing to forgo revenge, entitlement and self-aggrandizement? And with hindsight, what different choices would we make, knowing what we know now? We all arrive into this world to parents who assign us our race, religion, culture and social status. Over our beginnings, we have no choice 
But the moment we awaken our capacity to ask why and what may be, we begin to change our ability to make choices. And choices that take us out of the box of limitation and scarcity. And as we begin to acknowledge that we have no right, and as we begin to acknowledge that we have no right answers, only the rigor and integrity of ethical exploration, we move towards collaboration and cooperation and away from exploitation, coercion, shame and blame. We take responsibility for our choices. We begin to create the building blocks of utopia as an ongoing project. Reason and freedom were the twin sons around which, around which Rick's world turned. Reason, not as in cold logic, as antonym of emotion, but reason as in, as in the process by which the why of things is explored, dug at, exposed to meaning, and through meaning, extended and, and extends an invitation to understanding. The freedom he valued was not in anarchy and irresponsibility, but in the willingness to take responsibility for making things happen for the good, for morally rich and sustainable living. And I'll give the last words to Rick on... Hmm. On page 85 of the Eye of the Needle, the first edition, this one, he writes, A grossly unequal society is immoral at any time. In our time, it's also stupid. We can no longer afford the waste of resources involved. We can no longer afford to stifle creativity, inhibit cooperation, and foster fears and destructive competition for scarce, for scarce goods. Unless we end, and then back on page 84, unless we end our obsession with growth and relocate the resources that we do have left to provide for our vital material needs, food, shelter, and health, we can look forward to a future of famine, growing, e growing inequality, social conflict, and universal hate and fear in the struggle for survival. And we are facing that now, aren't we, globally? The last thing I'd like to say is that Rick's papers, um, some of them are housed at the uh, Malhabi Library in, 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 at, in, in Durban, and, more, and the rest of his papers will be archived at its, um, thanks to the work and effort of Susan Klassen from uh, Canada. Sorry, from sorry, Susan, I, Susan, I can't remember uh, from Penn State University with their help and with also the help of um, the economics department. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for the time. Have I stopped yeah, thank you. Into silence? Uh, Thank you so much for that. For, uh, I think that was utterly brilliant. Um, I think as we reflect and think about how much uh, kind of Rick Turner affected all of us, I think it would be fair to also point out the, the, the uh, kind of fantastic role that Fozia uh, 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 played in kind of affecting so um, m m many of us, and I would certainly include myself in that group. We're now going to move on to kind of hearing a few voices from a younger, from a younger, uh, from a younger generation who uh, have been reflecting on the book and who've been reflecting on the uh, the 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 thoughts of, of, of uh, kind of Jerry and the thoughts of, 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 of Bozia. Uh, and and to, 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 to make some sense of what the book means to uh, 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 people who were not there in 
in the 1970s or who might not have been affected as much by that time as, as, as kind of some of us have. So our first uh, uh, kind of res uh, respondents, it, uh, uh, Tumaleng um, Mokhale, uh, it, uh, Tumaleng's a research assistant um, in the center. He has a, a kind of honors degree in, in kind of economics uh, and he's doing his, his master's in economics, all of it at Ritz University. His kind of research interests are in the, the, the kind of fields of, of, of financial economics, uh, kind of inequality and uh, 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 competition. So let me pass it on to you, Itumalek. Uh, thank you, Imran, for the kind words. Um, such introductions always make one feel important. Whew. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Imran said, my name is Itumeleng Mokhali. Uh, and mine is very simple. It is to bring uh, a youth's perspective into today's gathering. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we sit, uh, as we gather to, uh, this evening to to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the book, The Eye of the Needle. And as we reflect upon the ideas that Rick articulates in this book, it is very imperative that we ask ourselves this very simple but fundamental question. And that question is, are Rick's ideas still relevant today, especially from a young person's perspective? In my attempt to answer this question, I will take you through a personal journey of mine, uh, which occurred in 2016 when I was a freshman here at VETS in 2016, a journey through the eyes of Fismas Fall, how I experienced it, and what some of the parallels that we can draw from my own experience and my own observations to those of Rick during his, uh, his time. But before I can tell you about my experience of Fismas Fall, I need to tell you about what Fismas Fall meant and symbolized to me. To me, Fismas Fall was more than just fees falling. To me, Fismas Fall was a mechanism to highlight the contemporary socioeconomic issues that still exist and persist in today's society. In essence, Fismas Fall was a mechanism to highlight the broader context of inequality that still exists in South Africa 25, more than 25 years into our democracy. Into our democracy. It is a mechanism to highlight the access into higher institutions of learning. And most importantly, it was a mechanism to highlight the commodification of education, which is very ironic because education is a right, but if it's a right, then why commodify it? How I experienced FISMAS Fall, I experienced it in two folds, one from a res perspective and one from a general student's perspective. I was at Menzores, and this is the approach we took. We took a very militant and hierarchical approach. However, decisions were collectively made by the House, and wherever there would be disputes, the majority would, ha would have the final say. In everything and anything, there was a free flow of information, and every step of the way was transparent. This, ladies and gentlemen, resonates with Rick's idea of participatory dem uh, democracy, where he states that workers can be in control of a factory and most importantly, workers are more than capable of making uh, high-level executive decisions. And he was of the belief that whichever uh, information that they did not have, it was information that was pe uh, pe uh, purposefully restricted to them. Ladies and gentlemen, this became very key in our fight for FISMA, uh, for FISMA's fall, in that in every one of us, we pulled in the same direction because we knew our positions and the roles that we had to play. And, uh, and in so doing, it was easy for us to achieve our objectives, and it became difficult for the university to collapse us as a house, the men's res house. As a general student of the university, they took a very bizarre approach. They called it a socialist, but it was very hierarchical in that suggestions would be taken from the masses, but the leaders would have a final say. And this 
if you uh, you read closer into the book, this is something Rick wants again, against because it breeds an elitist mentality and it creates a separation from the masses to the leaders. And this is one of the reasons why in that movement, everyone pulled in different direction. Also, this can be attributed to the political affections that are prevalent, mainly the EFF and the PRA. And this later created distrust towards our leaders. As I was a foot soldier in that uh, movement, the cracks were easily visible, and I always had the, uh, at the back of my mind had this notion that should the university want to weaken the movement, they'll do so with ease, and they later did. The university took a very, um, just like in Rick's time, where student movements and strikes and uh, riots were met with brute and violent resistance, the university took the same approach. This is very ironic because uh, Vets University calls itself a progressive university and it, it is a space where intellectual ideas are engaged upon. But when it came to them acting upon the word, instead they took a short left and they employed a, milita a, a militant approach. They militarized our campus. In that we'd even joke about it whenever we'd see police, we'd say, this is a member of the uh, police academy. That's how uh, much police there was uh, in, on our campus. And later, they decided to uh, deploy other tactics that the apartheid regime employed in that they targeted our leaders to weaken our movement as if that was not enough they decided to strike fear amongst us the students in that they suspended some expelled some and they jailed some uh, to make matters worse, they intentionally targeted residences and this is uh, where rick's ideas of worker, uh, worker power comes in i'll later come back to that point more than that, they also captured some of our student leaders, right? This is something the apartheid uh, regime was famous for. They turned them against some of us. Some they made uh, in Pimpis. How did they man uh, manage to do those? Some of them, they uh, promised them to remove their historical debts. Those that are uh, money hungry, they gave them money. Some of them, they gave them positions within the university. Now, just like Rick questioned the leaders in his time, I also questioned the leaders of my time. Uh, this, uh, do these leaders, genu did these uh, leaders genuinely believe in the cause that they were fighting for? Or was the struggle a means to an end? Or should, we, uh, should I question the system, the capital system that Riggs uh, talks about? Remember, the system is intentionally built in such a way that whoever dies to, uh, dares to challenge or threaten, it, devour, it devours them. If you don't believe me, ask Mark Zuckerberg, but that's a debate for another day. In essence, what I'm trying to ask here, ladies and gentlemen, is that are we fighting a losing battle by trying to fight the system, or is it a question of integrity towards our leaders? Just like uh, the 1968 movements uh, that happened during Rick's time, they were inspired by the 1960 student uh, 1968 student movements that were happening in Paris. A similar feat happened with Fismas Fall, but this time it was us who inspired other students. I remember in America, in the Netherlands, and in Brussels. Just like the student movements in Rick's time were racially motivated, Fismas Fall was also racially motivated. It became a struggle of those who are for FISMAS fall and those who are against FISMAS fall. And it became clear, very, very clear. The white students were against it and the black students were for it. More than anything, FISMAS fall highlighted our uh, frustration with our lack of political voice. And more than anything, the ease at which the university disregards the black students' uh, struggles. In essence, we were just tired and frustrated with how the university was run, and in so doing, FISMAS fall became a direct challenge to the university, and we later changed their thinking. One compliment I have of Rick's idea is his belief that workers had the political power to bring any change that was needed in his time, and this became significant in our time, in that when the workers decided to join the movement, they joined it, at a point where it was at its lowest. And as I said, at our res, the police once tried uh, to infiltrate us, to capture our leaders and to take some of us who were visible. And the workers were the ones who uh, helped us to take control of the res and they gave us the tip off. And further that, 
it makes sense what Rick was talking about, because if you compare and contrast a worker life and a student life, a worker's life is permanent. You cannot wake up today and decide you want to quit an adult life, but as a student, I can, I can decide to quit, or a student's life, I can graduate and I, and I move on to other things, I get employed. Right, and this became evident in that the student movement after FISMA's fall, 2016 to be pre uh, precise, they became weaker and weaker and thus ineffective in achieving their objectives. And thus, Rick was spot on when he said, workers are irreplaceable and that to bring about any political change, they are needed. And this also can be attributed to the shift in dynamics that we're seeing in that Yes, the workers have power, but their power have reduced. And this is in no way part of their fault. But it can also be attributed to the fact that the system has only gotten stronger and stronger of the, uh, as the years have gone by. And this is one thing I believe Rick saw uh, beforehand. One criticism that I have, though, of him was his view on riots and student movements. And he believed that they were counterproductive, right? I am not, when I read the book, it is not immediately clear where they stem from, but if I could speculate, I would say it was made from his moral principles or it could emanate from his Christian beliefs. But again, it's not clear. Why do I choose to criticize that point? Ladies and gentlemen, if you read this book precisely, his Rick's utopian thinking, his vision, his ultimate vision, I personally believe it was about moral victory. And when you look at FISMA's fall, FISMA's fall is or was a moral victory, particularly to black students and workers. Because if you look at our primary objectives, it was free education. And then later, as the uh, workers joined, it became about insourcing, right? Now, if you read this book, especially his idea on participatory democracy, Rick uh, emphasizes the point that workers need to be in control of their labor. And this is what FISMA, uh, FISMA's fault afforded to the university workers. Now they're in control, even, no, even though not in, uh, in, full, in full control, and they're able to participate in the decisions of the university. Right. As I said, we, cha we challenged the university's thinking and changed their perception. One simple uh, example I can give you is that before, you could not register here at VETS if you had historical debt or you did not have the registration fee. Through FISMA's fall, we managed uh, to change them to say, if you have less than 20,000, you owe less than 20,000, you can't register. And if you don't have the money, as some of us, we don't have the money. I am from Soweto. Where am I going to take 10,000 in January? It's impossible. And as such, they said, no, it's fine. You can waiver and pay later. Ladies and gentlemen, as I read this book, I am of the perception that when Rick was writing his book, he was full of pessimism towards uh, his leaders and towards the future that he was seeing at that time. You can't blame him, right? But as I sit here, more than 50 years since this book has been written, I stand in the same corner, if I may say so, in that I am very pessimistic towards my leaders. And when I start to think about the future, I start having those pessimism doubts, ladies and gentlemen. And in so doing, this is, in my humble opinion, I believe Rick's ideas are still relevant and relatable, and that's where I'd love to leave it. Thank you very much. Uh, great, Itumelang, thank you for that. We're going to shift um, uh, kind of now to Amsterdam. These are the, the kind of great advantages of technology. Uh, our next uh, 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 kind of respondent is Ruth uh, Castel Branco. Ruth leads uh, one of the large research programs in uh, can, uh, that's, uh, that's in SCIS. Um, on the future of work. Um, like many others who were affected by Rick's work, uh, Ruth uh, worked for, for a l l long time in the trade union movement, worked in the ILO, and kind of interestingly, like, uh, uh, like many of us here, did her master's degree um, kind of at UND in precisely the same sort of program that uh, Pozia did her 
master's degree in. Ruth uh, kind of recently completed her PhD here at Wits University. Uh, she's she was recently awarded uh, she was recently awarded an a, a kind of open society foundation uh, uh, kind of inequality f f f fellowship and she's uh, started some some work converting her phd into a book which is uh, tentatively titled beyond post work utopias let me then pass it on to Ruth. Thank you, Imran, uh, for the introduction. It is truly an honor to be part of this incredible intergenerational gathering. I think that my colleague Ituma Lang has uh, raised a number of challenges, and I just hope that we can have some good debate about some of these critical questions. Reading the eye of the needle is, um, it's, it's astonishing because it's a product of its time, a time where despite militant resistance across much of Southern Africa, um, Southern Africa was still largely under colonial domination. But it's also a timeless text which raises critical questions for the present. The book begins in its first page with what I initially interpreted as an engagement primarily with white South Africans. And I have to admit, I found this somewhat jarring. Um, I was born in Mozambique in 1983 amidst a revolution. As a child, I learned how armed struggle for independence had liberated us from colonialism, about the support from our uncle Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia and our grandfather Julius Nyerere of Tanzania about the anti-imperialist struggle against apartheid in South Africa. In fact, I see there's many participants in this call today that were part of that space. And, and we also learned that we would dig the tomb of capitalism and exploitation. <laughs> Despite the contradictions of Mozambique's post-colonial revolution, I never considered, nor were we taught, that the consciousness of whites would be of any relevance to African liberation. Who cares if white South Africans are absolutely and inevitably carnivorous, as Turner asks on the first page? Now, I suspect, and I'm very curious to hear more from Fazia and others, that Turner himself might have struggled with the question of audience, for he quickly moves to explore the absolute limits of possibility by sketching an ideally just society while Turner didactically challenged White's sense of superiority, his audience was far larger, for he sought to deconstruct the very tenets of white supremacy and create the space to reimagine what he identifies as values, behaviors, and institutions that are so essential to the construction of a utopian society. Now, I have to say that rage is markedly absent, perhaps with the exception of this image on the cover. Um, certainly, any utopian project has to envision the possibility of change. What's the point of organizing? No one is born a revolutionary. But I can't help but wonder why the indignities of violence aren't more prominently featured. What we in Mozambique used to sing, non vamos esquecer, we will not forget. Yet, as Turner seamlessly switches between audiences, I was reminded now in the contemporary period of a call by the Black Lives Matter movement to white progressives, organize your people first, they're the problem. And in thinking about this book, um, I'm struck by the various audiences um, that uh, Rick Turner tries to engage with. Now, Turner's vision for a democratic socialist future is especially topical as contemporary left forces globally struggle to respond to a deepening crisis of reproduction. Disillusioned by statist experiences of socialism, daunted by capitalism's ability to save itself from self-destruction, and increasingly dubious 
about the viability and desirability of class struggle, many on the left have retreated to a reformist position, which seemingly sidesteps the pitfalls of revolution, or at least helps us deal with our crisis of confidence. Marxist sociologist Owen Wright dubbed these real utopias, what he called viable and achievable reforms rooted in utopian ideals with the potential to undermine the exploitative foundations of capitalism and transform class relations. Chief among contemporary utopian proposals is universal basic income, which is an unconditional and universal cash transfer paid regularly to all on the basis of citizenship rather than employment. In his now renowned book, Give a Man a Fish, James Ferguson argues that the proliferation of these cash transfer programs across Southern Africa represents a harbinger of an instrument for a radical politics of distribution anchored in a notion of a rightful share rather than expiring forms of social incorporation. Ferguson is among a growing group of anti-work scholars who argue for the urgent need to decenter wage work from the social and political imaginary in the context of growing labor insecurity. The underlying assumptions are that wage work is no longer a meaningful form of social incorporation and that a continued focus on politics at the point of production amounts to little more than productivist fundamentalism, that the notion of a rightful share is an effective basis for political claim making, and that these cash transfer programs are a powerful instrument to drive forth this distributional politics. Now, that universal basic income has garnered increasing traction, particularly in the COVID period, is not surprising. After all, uh, income support is an important form of ensuring um, sustenance in the context of growing poverty and inequality. What is shocking, however, is that a reformist policy that largely leaves the terms of capital accumulation unchecked, delinking de production and redistribution, has become such an important anchor of contemporary left politics across much of the world. In this context, Turner's take on utopias is particularly refreshing. For what I read, is that he sees production and redistribution as two sides of the same coin. As Turner points out in his book, economic power cannot be disassociated from ownership. Given the racialized nature of capitalist development in South Africa, and I would say in Southern Africa as a whole, this involves control over the means of production. In fact, he proposes expropriation without compensation. And ensuring control over the means of production is particularly important because work is the primary form of socialization. And here I quote, it is only if the workers participate in the control of the central part of their lives, their work, that they can develop the personal qualities of autonomy, initiative, and self-confidence. Now. Turner does not strike me as romantic or politically naive, although um, it would be interesting to hear more from his comrades. He grapples with what he terms various complicating factors of the kind of participatory democracy that he agenda that he proposes. These include the limits of participation, the tendency towards centralization, the dangers of oligarchy. Furthermore, he recognizes that this form of worker control does not exist in a vacuum, that enterprises need to relate with each other and with the world, that the state is important, that state planning is critical to coordinate both production, but also redistribution. And he draws on both successful and failed experiences from across the global North and the South, including Tanzania's Ujama model um, you know, much of Southern Africa was still under colonial domination, but I really value the attempt to embed these problems of decolonization, the challenges of decolonization within broader debates happening across the African continent. 
which he did through his analysis of negritude, but also within the sort of practical experiments that were taking place at the time. And, and through this analysis, he presents a proposal on how to organize a worker-run society, complete with widespread political education and analysis, analyzes that relationship to the state. Through this process, he identifies the Black working class as what we would term the revolutionary subject, capable of bringing about a revolution, not from above, as vanguardists might argue, but from below. Now, given global restructuring, financialization, automation, who is the revolutionary subject today or subjects? What forms of organization can pol progressive politics take? What is the role of organizations of peasants, informal workers, the unemployed, others that are excluded from direct labor capital relations? I suspect that these are questions that Turner would have struggled with as well, because the way that he identifies working class is in fact quite narrow. It excludes those that are outside of the factory floor, including women. His book, of course, preceded much of the feminist writing, which challenged this dualist understanding of capitalist development that saw the domestic sphere as embedded within processes of production. But he ultimately assumes a strict division between these two, a sort of dualist position. And he doesn't explore how subjectivities and interests can crisscross across these. And that, I think, is one of the challenges we face today. He concludes that there is no way in which looking at, for instance, associations of peasants or African tenants, sorry, that they could use their position as tenants to generate power. As tenants, he argues, the only activity or action they could undertake would be to refuse to pay their rent. And this would be sufficiently marginal an act to have no significant impact on the political scene in South Africa. Trade unions arise when the economy has developed to a point where workers have the potential, a strong bargaining power. Now, reading this book at a moment when liberation movements across the continent are facing a profound crisis is particularly poignant. Turner's book is an analysis of South Africa, one that explores the possibilities and limitations of change, but his argument is one which can be extended to the post-colonial world. Indeed, he goes out of his way to overcome South African exceptionalism to some extent. He both challenges liberal proposals for racial integration, which he argued would leave the roots of oppression and exploitation uncontested, and status forms of socialism rooted in political vanguardism and central planning. But the trade union movement he identifies are increasingly fragmented, discarded as the legitimate representatives of the interests and aspirations of the people. And so what does popular democracy look like? And I leave you with that question today. Thank you, Aluta Continua. Uh, great, thank you so much, Ruth. So we, we've, we've got essentially two kind of questions on the Q&A and I'm going to read them out in a, in a, in a, uh, in a kind of precede form and then give our two main speakers, Jerry and Fozia, the, the kind of opportunity to, to, to kind of respond if they'd like to, 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 to these points, but to kind of any of the, the thoughts that, uh, that kind of Itumeleng um, and Ruth raised as well. So the first kind of questions from Robert Kricher who for a long time worked in the NRF. And Robert's question is, is to ask whether uh, uh, kind of Rick was, was, was kind of affected by or informed by the writings of, of uh, uh, Fanon at all. And the second question in a, th a three-part thing, but uh, I'll, I'll sort of try to, to kind of summarize from uh, 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 Devon uh, Pele from Wits. And De Devon makes the, the point that uh, Turner's book 
had a uh, uh, had kind of to use he, he, uh, kind of his uh, kind of his words remarkable uh, uh, points w were made about the l l limits of economic growth and its uh, d uh, d uh, d uh, d uh, d devastating ecological impacts and Devon's asking whether uh, you uh, whether Jerry of Fuzzy, I have any reflections um, on that. And then there's a kind of question from David Hampson, who asks whether Rick kind of had any confidence that black uh, that black leadership would. Uh, uh, carry out reforms um, and develop a socialist and uh, non-exploitative society. So just to kind of invert things slightly, I'm going to suggest that we, we take some responses first from Fozia, uh, uh, then we can, we can come to Jerry, and then we'll have a few final remarks from uh, kind of Eddie and Mark to close off the evening. Uh, so over to you, uh, uh, for Zia, if you um, if you'd like to deal with any of those, um, Robert uh, Franzano, yes, Franzano did play uh, a role in in Rick's thinking, uh, especially um, he gave um, he introduced Fano to his political science students. He also, in his talk on Black Power at UMB, he included. Uh, the work of Fano, especially the concept of negritude and how the consciousness of the colonized is still trapped within the, the relationship imposed on them by the colonizers. Um, so that, yeah, definitely uh, influenced. And that thinking comes into his... Um, talking about black power and how it's not just um, the question of uh, a statement of your value, but also looking at how much of the colonization process, how much of the, the domination process by the whites have, have been internalized by you. We don't escape the consequences of racism, of colonization. Uh, it works both ways. And I don't know if that is satisfying, Robert, but we can have that argument, we can continue it later. Uh, the other one, David Hemson. Uh, so confidence in black leadership per se, without qualification, how can you have confidence in a category as broad as that? You have confidence in people willing to look at what it is they want, looking at the kind of society they want, looking at to what extent they have taken responsibility for how they have behaved in the process of achieving their roles, getting to the leadership position. Many of the leaders um, have been raised on oppositional thinking. We have been against, not so much for there has been the the Freedom Charter, but the fleshing out of the Freedom Charter, exactly how the, the future would look, exactly how the, looking at the future, how that would affect us, what would we have to become to achieve that future? Um, that's nowhere there, and you can't have confidence in, in, a, in a vague group of people who have not addressed the issue. Leadership in itself does not deliver the kind of confidence to create the reforms needed to develop a socialist, non exploitative society. And yeah, and Devon, yes, the whole thing about limits to growth, uh, the quote that I read at the end, very much part of um, Rick's thinking about what we do to our planet and the importance of caretaking and the utilization of resources. We don't have to have this huge house. We don't have to have 
the, the yacht. We don't have to consume more, um, uh, hold on to more than we can consume. We, our values are so skewed. If we think more about how we redistribute resources and maybe move away from me first, we can have the sense of taking care of not only ourselves and our communities, but of the environment itself. And I just want to say something uh, in response to Ruth, uh, that the eye of the needle is, uh, he addresses to whites because whites were the problem. And, and that was the, 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 the reason for the eye of the needle. The analysis is an analysis of power, of a power structure and how you engage with a power structure that is entrenched and is very resistant to change. Um, that's what I think I want to say right now. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, Jerry and check if he would, would like to respond to anything. I've got nothing to add to that. The only thing is coincidentally, coincidentally, fun on. Um, Wretched of the Earth was published 60 years ago last year. And they've brought out a, the same edition for the same introduction by Jean-Paul Sartre and other stuff added to it. And I saw a review by Kwame Apia, and that's how I was alerted to that. That's the only thing that I can add. Thanks, Imran. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Imran, Sherry. I just want to say one thing. Sure. Imran, I just want to say yes, one thing. Yes, over to you, Fazil. Um, Franz Fano's wife, Josie, came to South Africa and visited us, and we talked about the book, and talked about how, what Fano was talking about and what we were talking about in South Africa, how they meshed and about how we have to be careful of black consciousness becoming a middle-class um, slogan rather than a reworking of identity. Thanks. We're now going to m m move on to two final reflections. The f first is, is, is from kind of Eddie Webster, who I think needs little introduction. And since I left my notes there, I'm, I'm just going to make it up. Uh, kind of Eddie was for a long time uh, uh, kind of professor of sociology at WITS. Uh, we've been extremely pleased to have him at SCI as, as a distinguished professor. Uh, kind of Eddie was kind of really centrally involved in those uh, kind of early I, um, IIE days. Um, and we often give the second last word to our, uh, 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 the, 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 what, what, what we in SCIS call the Madala of our society. So over to you, Eddie. Thank you, Imran. Um, I'm going to uh, Colleagues, uh, comrades, friends, and particularly uh, Fazia, it's wonderful to hear you again. There are moments uh, in our violent but divided past when black and white South Africans have crafted a vision that transcended the narrow roles each had been placed in by the architects of apartheid. The gathering in Cliptown in Soweto in 1955 to craft the Freedom Charter with the evocative cry, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, is an eternal moment. The coming together of workers and students in Durban in the early 70s is another such moment. Here, at the height of apartheid, two movements were to emerge that began a journey that was eventually to bring apartheid to its knees. 
in the words, in the provocative words, of veteran political scientist Mahmoud Mamdani, and I quote, the most important force that began to bring apartheid to its knees, and bring a chip, sorry, the most important force for this change was not the arms struggle, not exile politics, nor the international boycott movement. The force that began to bring apartheid to its knees, Bamdani argues, was provided by student activists of all colors and by migrant and township labor. This was in his book, Neither Settler Nor Native. These two movements, the Black Consciousness Movement and the Workers' Movement, together dramatically shifted, he argues, the locus of struggle from exile professional revolutionaries to the communities of South Africa. It could be argued that Mamdani overstates the significance of the Durban <coughs> moment. But in bringing back home, a vision re-emerged in the giant textile mills of Pine Town and the campuses of the University of Natal of a non-racial and egalitarian society. Of course, there were deep divisions, but we are gathered here today to remember the man who captured that vision in that remarkable book, The Eye of the Needle. Six years later, the Durban security police attempted to kill that vision with a cowardly assassin bullet. Turner's vision gave opponents of apartheid a sense of hope at a time of deep pessimism in the future of South Africa. He did this by successfully combining a radical vision of the future with an argument for the strategic use of power. Let me illustrate. The first point to make about this vision is that it's a moral vision, where the reader is invited to make a choice between capitalist values, where people are treated as things, and where society has people as its central value, the human model, he calls it. He refers to this as participatory democracy, or if you like, democratic socialism. I remember Rick saying, once in a conversation, if it's not democratic, it's not socialist. The second point to make, that his vision of a future South African society was a radical one. There was to be a fundamental redistribution of wealth and power. Workers would control industry and agriculture, and the economy would be run along democratic lines. South Africa's problem, he argued, is not only racial. Its roots lie in deep social and economic inequalities. A traditional free market solution will never work because, he argued, it would only co-opt a few black people into the elite while leaving intact the real mechanism of exploitation the structures of South Africa's racial capitalism. Traditional liberals, in other words, and that was his target here, were unrealistic. That's why he refers in chapter nine to the impracticality of realism. It may be worth noting here that Turner's vision of participatory democracy was typical of the new left rather than the traditional left. As a result, he looked to workers' self-management in Yugoslavia as the be and the Ujamaa villages and schemes of Julius Nere's Tanzania as the best examples of participatory democracy. He did not look to the Soviet Union, which he firmly rejected in the eye of the needle as, and I quote, a large 
inefficient and undemocratic state bureaucracy, unquote. Thirdly, this vision, he believed, needs to be utopian. What he meant by the word utopian, this is my reading, is that we need to develop realistic alternatives to the current institutions and social structures. Ideas that are grounded in the real potential of social change. What some have called real utopias, and, and Ruth um, mentioned Eric, the late Eric Olin Wright, who used that term, real utopias, uh, a, 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 a sort of oxymoron. In other words, a belief that what is pragmatically possible is not fixed independently of our imaginations, but is itself shaped by our vision. We see this notion of utopia in the strategic side of Turner's thinking in the postscript to the Eye of Needle called the present as history. Here he explores the organizational possibilities for change. He makes it clear that he rejects armed struggle as unrealistic and economic sanctions as counterproductive, arguing instead, and I quote, that there's only one sphere in which Africans do have potential power and in which their power potential is in fact growing. This is within the economy, unquote. It is important to note here that Turner explored favorably the possibility of using institutions of separate development, especially Chief Buteleze, as a platform through, through which a link could be made to the potential power of the urban working class and thereby, quote, develop a coherent and powerful black political movement in South Africa. However, the very important qualification, this suggestion needs to be placed in its context. At this time, the ANC from exile had links with Butilese and was, it's only in 1979 that these two national movements, Inkata and the African National Congress, began to take diametrically opposed paths. Let me conclude by asking the question, what relevance does Turner's vision have for us today? The answer, I trust, is now clear. Turner provided a generation disillusioned by the repression of the states and the challenge of black consciousness with a vision. A vision of what a new, non-racial, ecologically sensitive and egalitarian South Africa could become. And he provided a strategy of how we could begin to reach it. Much has changed in the world of politics and the world of work over the last 50 years. But the enduring legacy of Rick Turner, and indeed to defy the assassin's bullet, we must continue to raise the critical questions that define this intellectual project. Above all, we need to take forward the moral vision that underlies his writings. Thank you. Uh, uh, great, Eddie, as always, provocative and thoughtful. Thank, thank you. I'm going to move straight on to M Mark Hayward, who's uh, uh, going to, sh to, to share some thoughts with us. Um, Mark is a, is a, is a, a kind of social activist, uh, kind of interested in, in, in kind of questions of human rights and, and kind of social justice. Uh, people will know him quite well from uh, uh, his work in, 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 in kind of Section 27 um, and the Treatment Action Campaign, among others. Mark now runs uh, most kind of creatively and thoughtfully, I might add, the um, uh, a daily um, 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 maverick citizen section and and through mark 
we were able to partner with the Maverick for the seminar. So we, we're now going to shift to, to Cape Town and to Mark. Mark, um, Mark over to you. Uh, good evening, everybody, from Cape Town, as Imran said. And thank you to the speakers, and thank you just as much to uh, the nearly 300 people who have joined us uh, from all over the world uh, and across times and generations and histories of organization and activism. Uh, as a, as a, journalist, a journalist these days, an activist journalist, I should say, uh, I've been watching in particular the chat uh, that has been taking place in the course of this uh, seminar. And two things have uh, struck me uh, about what has happened in the last two hours. The first is most obviously the enduring respect for Rick Turner's life, ideas, and activism. Uh, 45 years after his death, and based today around a political text that clearly remains relevant and has not been given the due, not as something that is archaic and just about history, but something that is about a method and a means to help us to tackle the problems of the present. And the second thing that has struck me is the desire expressed by many, many people to revive ways of organizing, analyzing, and thinking that can help social justice activists, socialists, beyond the current impasse, help us through the current impasse that we face, not only in South Africa, but globally. I think very few people would have imagined, and certainly, well, perhaps Rick Turner might have, given what we've heard of Eye of the Needle today, but the extent of deprivation that still exists in South Africa uh, today, 12 million people uh, uh, who exist uh, below the poverty, the food poverty line of 595 rand a month, 75% unemployment amongst young people, class relations, wealth relations, basically undisturbed uh, since 1994. But as Fosia said, what Eye of the Needle presents us with is a testament of hope. And I think that it is hope, not naive hope, not hope simply just because we need something to counter despair, but hope in our power and ability to transform this society that, 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 that we need most. Holding this webinar, seminar, this hybrid today, on the 22nd of February uh, is coincidental, but comes on two important days, which also indicate the crisis that we face. The first is the day on which uh, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine, uh, sparking probably a new difficult period of capitalist crisis, of war, of resources being directed to the arms industry, uh, taking us away from the possibility that many people believed that the COVID moment might present to organize against the inequalities that COVID has revealed. But secondly, this seminar has taken place on the eve of uh, another budget in South Africa tomorrow, uh, a budget which will again reveal how the current government is stuck within what was described as contingent constraints, artificial, imagined uh, constraints that they're not prepared to challenge or to move beyond 
and which condemns so many people to continuing poverty and deprivation. So what struck me about this afternoon's discussion or what was confirmed through this afternoon's discussion is the power and the possibility that still remains with, organize, with organization if we are prepared to rise to those challenges. But what Rick Turner and this afternoon's speakers, all of them, and the dialogue between generations also shows us is that if we're to realize those, that power, we are going to have to shake ourselves out of silos that we have become accustomed to working within. We are going to have to accept that the politics of the present is a broken politics and that many of the organizations that we have looked to to transform the present into a better future are broken as well. We're going to have to find new ways of thinking that takes us beyond rigid preconceptions. And we are going to have to stop talking in echo chambers of the like-minded rather than addressing and working with the poor and the oppressed, including those who are drawn in the crisis to short-term populist solutions that offer no solution at all. So I'm very happy and just want to finish by thanking the Southern Center for Inequality Studies for hosting this, uh, th this webinar. I hope that this project will uh, continue beyond today. There was talk in the chat about an oral history, about collecting the works of Richard Turner, works that have not been read, works that have not been published, about the importance of using Rick to catalyze intergenerational conversations about how we change the present that we, that we exist in. But most of all, I think this evening challenges us to continue this project, not as uh, nostalgia uh, for Rick Turner, uh, for ways of thinking and organizing that have been lost, but to continue this project uh, with the energy that it is generating for change uh, to address uh, the crisis that we face in this present uh, uh, moment. So thank you everybody very, very much uh, for being uh, part of this discussion. And uh, with those few words, uh, I will hand back to Imran. We will in the Daily Maverick, Maverick uh, publish the uh, recording of this afternoon's uh, seminar as well, I hope, as the wonderful inputs and speeches of Fosia, Tumaleng, Ruth, uh, and others, so that it is accessible uh, to an even wider audience. Thank you very much uh, for, for being with us. Good evening. Uh, great, Mark. Thank you so much for that. Um, so kind of a few Kind of a few years ago, when, when we took the decision at Wits University to kind of set up SCIS, we were kind of driven by a number of issues that concerned us about the way the, the, the kind of field of inequality was being, uh, was being researched and being managed in the uh, policy process. Among that, there were two that I think were really paramount to why we made the decision to set up SCIs. The first was that we felt that narratives about inequality were too much grounded in technical, in technical analysis that didn't put kind of issues of power and kind of inequality of power um, at the center of the debate. Um, and secondly, we felt that the importance of, of context and, and kind of rigorous research in trying to kind of understand the problem and to imagine and work systematically at a plan for a more equal society was something that was really important. I think both of these ideas really draw in part on the work of, Rick, of 
on the work of Rick Turner. And it's been a fantastic seminar. Uh, lots of, of kind of old uh, 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 faces and, and comrades from Durban who were there with Rick at the time, Mem members, of, of, members of his family, his comrades at, at, uh, kind of at the time, uh, slightly younger people like me who were not there, but kind of deeply affected by it, and a lot of younger students have been able to join us today, and I think it's, a, it's been a fantastic event. I'd like to just thank, thank a few uh, 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 people who, who, who made this evening uh, uh, possible. I want to start with just acknowledging the role of Chris Desmond and Ben Roberts in suggesting the idea to us. I want to thank all, kind of all six of our speakers who I, th I thought were all fantastic. Uh, thanks to, to Mark and the, 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 the partnership with Maverick, but in kind of closing, a really, really special thank you to the SCIS team who made, uh, who, um, um, made the event happen today. Without all of the work that they've done to make sure that the speakers were kind of in the right place, that the technology worked as brilliantly as, as, as it did, um, I don't think tonight would have happened. So thank you to all of them. Uh, so kind of friends uh, kind of in the room and kind of everyone online, thank you so much for joining us today. Look out for more SCIS uh, uh, kind of research and events. And with that, uh, let me then close the evening. Uh, thank you all. Have a good evening.